In March of 1864, President Lincoln had enough of trying to find the right commander. He actually winds up putting Grant in command, and Grant vows that he's going to end the war within a year. He begins to launch three major offensives. He puts General Philip, Philip Sheridan in charge of laying waste to all the farmland in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley, which he does successfully. Then he tells General, General William Tecumseh Sherman, this formidable looking gentleman here, to uh, go from Chattanooga, Tennessee, all the way down to Atlanta, which he eventually does, and then some. And then Grant says that he is going to go after General Robert E. Lee himself. Grant starts off with 118,000 men. About half of them are casualties by June, but that's okay, he's got more. Lee had been reduced to about 40,000 men by that point. Grant himself just loses 40,000 men in battle um, during this campaign, and he is called a butcher by the Democrats, but that doesn't matter to him. His objective is to win. The Confederate losses were also heavy. The key difference here is that they couldn't be replaced. At the Battle of the Wilderness in Northern Virginia, uh, 11,000 Confederate uh, casualties happened. At the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, 10,000 Confederate casualties. Uh, there are 12,000 Union casualties at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Grant then pursues Lee to Petersburg, which is just south of Richmond's, and engages him in a nine-month siege. So re remember that Richmond was the uh, Confederate capital. Meanwhile, Sherman, following his objective, uh, takes 100,000 men and goes to Atlanta. Now, he is uh, very similar to Jackson in the case that when you give him an objective, he doesn't just meet the objective. He wants to meet the idea behind the objective, too. So he's a very uh, ruthless general, you could say, because he burns Atlanta. And then he marches on to Savannah. And while he's doing that, he destroys railroad tracks. Uh, his soldiers loot houses. They burn factories. They take Savannah. Uh, then they head northward. They take Charleston, North Carolina. Then they head on to Columbia, South Carolina. They move on into Virginia as well. He says, we cannot change the hearts of those people, but we can make war so terrible and make them so sick of war that generations would pass away before they would appeal uh, again appeal to it. By April of 1865, Grant had Lee absolutely cut off. Lee had no supplies. He had no reinforcements. It's because nobody is really left in the South that is willing or able to fight. Uh, Petersburg and Richmond are ordered to be evacuated by the Confederate government, what's, uh, what little bit is left of it. And then Lee begins to head west. Grant catches, him up, uh, catches up to him about 100 miles away. Lee at that point recognizes that the fight is over. There's no more that he can do. So he surrenders at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. He shows up to this surrender ceremony in a full dress uniform, a sash, a sword, the works. He is dressed uh, as best as an officer and a gentleman can. Grant, on the other hand, uh, actually almost forgets to get dressed, really, to, to that same regard. While he's going over there, he realizes he needs to be wearing a coat, at least for this type of event, so he grabs a private's coat along the way. The next day, Lee says to his troops that he was compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. Three quarters of the adult white male population in the Confederacy had fought in the war. The North still had four times the number of troops that the South did. Lee had 35,000 men, Grant had 113,000. What really happens here, though, is that Lee's surrender at the Appomattox Courthouse, his total uh, and complete surrender, helps prevent a large-scale guerrilla warfare erupting in the South, which could have drawn it out much, much longer. The fact that Lee just said, I'm done, and so is the entire army, is one of the things that uh, effectively puts an end to the war. Now, this war in the South, a uh, quarter of the white male population, the adult white male population in the South, died. A third of the livestock in the South was died. Half of the farm machinery was destroyed. And they also lost $2.5 billion of human property in the South. Factories were destroyed, what little they had. Railroads were destroyed. Property values plummeted as well. In Charleston, South Carolina, before the war, they had $400 million collectively of property value, and that was down to $50 million after the war. But the war was, really wasn't over yet. Oops, slide too far. On April uh, 14th of 1865, Major General Robert Anderson, the same man who handed over Fort Sumter, raised the flag once again over Fort Sumter. Not only was it the same man, it was the same flag that he had lowered when he surrendered the fort when the war began. By 10 p.m. that day, 
that same day, John Wilkes Booth enters the presidential box at Ford's Theater and shoots Lincoln in the back of the head. Booth was an actor. He was a former spy. He'd actually been in a plot to kidnap Lincoln as well. That, of course, did not happen. Uh, he leapt to the stage because this was his plan. He was supposed to leap to the stage, make his grandiose speech, and then run away and uh, get away on his horseback. Um, because, of course, he's an actor. He can't just simply do something and walk away. He has to actually make a big speech about it. So he shoots Lincoln. He jumps to the stage. At least that's the idea. But in some sort of historical irony, if you want to call it that, I'm not sure, uh, the spur on his boot catches the U.S. flag that is draped in front of the presidential box. So he falls and he breaks his leg. But he does manage to pull himself back up. He says, Six Semper Tyrannis, which is the allegedly and this is even, not even historically accurate, the same thing that uh, the assassins of Julius Caesar said after they assassinated Caesar. It means thus always for tyrants, or thus always the tyrant. Uh, they actually got that from, or Booth actually gets that from Julius Caesar the play by Shakespeare, so that's why it's historically dubious. And then he manages to hobble away, get away on horseback, uh, and he is actually, it takes the army and the secret service about two weeks to track him down they trap him in a barn near port royal virginia and booth refuses to give up so they set the barn on fire and then booth is later found dead from a possible self-inflicted inflicted gunshot wound uh, after they've cleared away the debris from the fire now that's not all though at the same time while booth is committing his assassination uh, lewis payne who was an accomplice to booth because this is actually this is one of those things where People talk about there being a conspiracy around something. This was actually a conspiracy, a bigger conspiracy. So a man named Louis Payne, Payne who was part of this conspiracy, attacks uh, the Secretary of State, William Seward, with a knife. Now, the Secretary of State had actually been in an accident a few days before this, and he was wearing a metal collar. And that's one of the things that actually saves his life, is the fact that he was wearing a metal collar, so the knife actually doesn't, act, doesn't get him. Uh, Payne also had showed up with a gun as well. But he had fired it at Seward's son, and it misfired, so he winds up hitting him on the head with a pistol, which alerts Seward himself to the fact that somebody's in the house, and that, therefore, uh, he's able to at least defend himself, uh, if not just with his neck. Now, I also said that this was a larger conspiracy. It's not just the Secretary of State. It's not just the President. Uh, Grant, of course, was a target as well. Johnson was a target. The Vice President was a target as well. Uh, the actual conspirators included Booth, uh, one ex-Confederate soldier, a carriage maker, and a druggist's clerk. Eight men are arrested, four men are hanged, one of them dies in prison, and three of them got pardons in 1869.